Hello, I'm Enter Elysium, and welcome to World War K. Um, now, we did lose part of the space station last time. It's still roughly in orbit. However, it's got Bill Kerman on board. So, it does actually have its own little engines, uh, and it's got the fuel tank. The fuel tank that we're, you know, used to, you know, refuel things, so it's got plenty of fuel. Um, so, uh, let's try and actually get it back near the station. We'll EVA Bill across, and everything will be shiny, and there won't be any problems whatsoever. At least in theory. Um, right, so the plan is I'm going to actually get Bill, Jeb and uh, Bob all on the sta station together and then we'll put them onto like the important craft to come up and maybe the big battleships and so on as we dock them and send them across. Now I've just sped this up a little bit just to, uh, you know, speed up the monotony of trying to intercept an orbit. I go just uh, burning to get rid of relative velocity and then burning at the target. Burning to get rid of velocity, burning at the target. You know the drill. Uh, so, trying to get closer. We've got plenty of fuel as you can see. The engines aren't particularly powerful. They weren't actually really designed to actually move it around in any meaningful manner. This is going to be the first thing up straight into an orbit. Bam! Leave it there. Dock everything onto this. Uh, unfortunately, that's not quite the case, is it? But it's got plenty of fuel, we don't need to worry about that. I I thought that like the fuel tank was damaged or something or whatever. I kind of forgot that there would be someone on board and forgot it would be Bill. Uh Ah. We are out of power. Which means we have no way of actually we've got plenty of monopropellant, we just don't have any nozzles for the non-propellant to come out of. So we can't actually change our uh facing. It's just gonna keep doing that. So get Bill out. And he's going to have to EVA across from here. Now, the problem is we've still got a lot of relative velocity. So we're going to have to burn to uh, negate that. And then burn towards the st Crap! Station! Oh my god, that was so close! Jesus! Bloody... Buggeration! Bloody hell, that was... <laughs> um, yeah, okay, we've managed to negate the... Uh... <laughs> Uh, yeah, we've managed to negate the relative velocity now. <laughs> um, and we're slowly going back towards the station. Uh, I, I don't know what would happen if Bill had hit the station then. Bill probably would have died. The station, I don't know, do, do Kerbals impacting at high speeds damage things? Or do the Kerbals just go poof? I don't know. I, I would say we have to test that, but that's probably against some sort of Kerbal rights. Um, there's probably convention that prevents that. But yeah, alright, we're back on board. Or we're back close to being on board. And, uh, yeah, that'll be fine. Now, the main thing I was going to do was I was going to make some like battleships and stuff, bring them up here. We could dock them to the space station temporarily. And, uh, yeah, leave it that for the day. But unfortunately, the the uh, the servers for the, the forums and so on are down at the moment. So I don't get the mods I actually really want to use. So I don't get the Lackluster Labs mod that I really want to use. Um... I can't get hold of the keythane mod so that I can put keythane probes on the moon, etc. So instead, we're going to start improvising. Uh, oh, crap, we can't go in there, that's full. Um, or you can just sit in the crew compartment, that's fine. There we go. And he's joining Jeb, because I sent Jeb up to on the module. You can see the module there, the one that replaced the module that was uh, kind of knocked off in the last fight. It's now got two uh, octagonal, not octagonal, they're six sided. Docking things. Anyway, so yeah, now Bill and Jeb both up there, and I've actually added this additional uh, docking port on a long strut just so that it doesn't interfere with the station because those ports around those uh, six sided things, I can't remember what they're called, they're kind of difficult to get at. So I've just put that long thing on there. It's also got a load of fuel, so we can refuel as well. Anyway, so as I was saying, the mission for today instead is going to be making an armed tug that we can use to take the equipment two other places and you know we could even put a battleship on the back and uh, tug the battleship around just to you know make it easier on fuel consumption etc. Um, so we're making an armed tug now. I'll do, I could have used a number of things. I wanted a three person tug so we can also move uh, personnel around. So I'm using the uh, B9 Aerospace three person space plane cockpit which is a problem because it doesn't actually have SAS. It has a lot of torque but it doesn't actually have an SAS installed uh, which is lacking I think. I think I need to maybe edit that in if it isn't 
Maybe there's an update that fixes that, or if that's meant to be a thing, then I'm personally I'm just going to edit that in because I don't see why some of the um, things should have and some shouldn't. Maybe it's because it's just a space, meant to be a space plane thing, but um, I don't use B9 mainly for the space plane, I use it for the just depart in general. I'm not a massive fan of space planes, you know, I do them occasionally, but in general I think, you know, the main focus of Curl Space Program is the core rocketry. I mean, I know some people love them, personally, yeah. Anyway, I'm putting a, a crap load of uh, nuclear engines on here, just push them out a bit so anything we're dragging behind us doesn't get fried and irradiated. Uh, I've got, what, 12? Just because I want a high thrust, because if we're dragging something, we don't want to be going, like, at 0 0.02 thrust to weight ratio. We want a nice thrust to weight ratio. The idea for this is I want to keep the thrust to weight ratio for this tug about 0.7. They are nuclear engines, so they're pretty crap, to be honest. Uh, they're great for fuel efficiency, though, so, you know. I want to get at least 4 kilometers of delta V in it, and about 0.7 thrust to weight ratio. Uh, I've added the monopropellant tanks there in... Uh, small ones. I could have just put on a big one, but frankly, I think the small ones look cool to do them like that. Uh, I'm considering Gatling cannons, but the Gatling cannons do weigh like over a ton each. So I think I'm probably just going to end up using missiles. Now if we get rid of that one, there we go, I've got point, yeah, over 0.7 for us to weight ratio. And it's going to go down a bit if I add more stuff. But uh, we've also got over 7 kilometers of delta V, which is, which is over the operational parameters. So that's all cool. Now, those of you who've been watching for a while, or you know, who've gone back and watched some of the past episodes, might remember the uh, destroyer we made. It was a destroyer, was it Corbett? Anyway, um, that actually managed to take out an asteroid and then use the ejection system to get away. Now, the ejection system there works so well and was so cool that I'm actually going to start trying to build these into as many ships as I can. So, for this tug, I'm putting an ejection system on the front here. Um, you know, this is also really good if we screw up a launch uh, because. You know, kind of don't want to have to simulate everything. It'd be nice if we could actually do some real launches. And if they go wrong, then we people survive. It's cool. It's all fine. It's all good. It's all good. Anyway, uh, so we've added some missiles because the Gatling cannons are a bit heavy. Missiles are cool. I know the Gatling cannons are basically more effective. They basically destroy most of what they hit. But missiles are just more fun and cool. And I've made them. They're an awesome mod. You should totally go get it. Anyway, I should probably add the second lot of missiles that I made to that. Uh, we're basically going to brute force this thing to orbit with a load of uh, orange fuel tanks. Maybe some asparagus staging, you know, a bit of asparagus, a bit of oregano. Get the thing to orbit, and that's how it's done. Uh, anyway. Yes. I, I've just eaten food, you can tell. Um, I, uh, we could have gone with a hexagonal configuration of six and then a central one, but I think we'll just go with four. I think that'll be sufficient. Lots of struts. Struts everywhere. Now, the EVA we did earlier, that was a pretty short EVA by uh, actual human standards. I mean, I think the, the longest EVA is over six hours. I know there was one that was like 6.55 or something. Um, I think there's longer than that. Uh, actually, you get a lot of problems with uh, EVAs and you get... Um, can cause decompression sickness. Now, if you don't know what decompression sickness is, decompression sickness is when you go from a low pressure environment to a high pressure environment, and it causes the gas to dissolve in your. Sorry, it's when you go from a high pressure environment to a low pressure environment. It's caused when the gas that's mainly nitrogen that's been dissolved in your blood uh, because of the pressure. Because at high pressures, you can dissolve more gas. So when you go to a low pressure environment, you can't dissolve as much gas, so the gas that's already dissolved, the excess, fuses out um, and turns into gas bubbles, so it's not in, dissolved in it anymore. Now having gas bubbles in your blood, not a great idea. Um, decompression sickness manifests in like a number of ways. I mean, the majority of the time it's just joint pain and so on, which is why you've got the bends, and bends used to be referring to specifically joint pain from it, but we talk about bends now as if it's just decompression sickness. Now divers get this, they go from like being in the sea to being on land. That's going from a high pressure environment to a low pressure environment. Um, you can also get this going from a high pressure environment to a low pressure environment outside of a spacecraft. So anyone doing an EVA on the International Space Station, for instance, goes from, I think it's like over 100 kilopascals, which is something like 14.7 PSI to 10 PSI or 70 kilopascals and they do that in the decompression chamber and they, uh, the airlock sorry, and they stay in the airlock overnight 
so that they're used to that pressure so it's not a massive jump from one pressure being inside to the second the other pressure being in their suits. Now launching this thing here, you can see that it's uh, it's going up a little bit slowly. Uh, this is even more annoying to actually uh, fly this plane, uh, this uh, rocket because it was going at about seven frames. I think I may have overdone it. You know the number of bits went into making that ring, that radial structure around the back. Yeah, that that part count um, definitely affected the frame rate. And not anywhere near damaging my system or crashing the game or whatever. Just yeah. Anyway, so whoa. It's a good thing we're building that escape unit, isn't it? Uh, probably just needed to activate the parachutes rather than the Cyprotrons as well, but you know, it's cool, it's good to know they work. Just testing, just testing. To make sure the engineers have got their, their shit down. Anyway. Uh, yes. I don't think I can be bothered landing this, to be honest. So, let's just skip ahead to the next one. And that'll be fine. We'll get, we'll solve our problems. I've added more struts this time around. And you've actually got a couple of docking ports on there so that we can actually dock onto the space station. Originally, I didn't put these these normal sized docking ports on, and I just put the big ass one on the back. And then I realised actually we're kind of going to need them to dock onto the station. Uh, of course, we're launching full time speed because you've seen a lot of launches before. You kind of used them already. Anyway, um, so yeah, uh, decompression sickness. Not a great thing on the whole. It doesn't happen all the time, and it varies like your susceptibility quite a lot. But uh, the majority of the time it happens it is in joints and stuff. It's just a bit of joint pain. The joint pain can be anything from aches to like sharp stabbing pains. Um, normally made worse when like you move the joints, but it can be a lot worse. It can happen stuff like you can get it in. Well, it can go to your heart. You can go to your lungs. It can go to your brain or your spine. None of these are particularly good places to get it. If it goes to like your lungs, you get like shortness of breath and stuff. If it goes to your heart. Well, you could pretty much have. Uh, a heart attack. That's not, not a great thing. Um, because to your brain you get all these neurological symptoms you can imagine because basically a bubble gets there, gets lodged, blood can't get past, part of your brain gets blood starved. So you get all the neurological symptoms you can imagine pretty much. Um, loss of memory, confusion, disorientation, uh, tingling, numbness, hypersensitivity, lack of sensitivity, seizures, unconsciousness, uh, everything. I, uh, you know, basically like a stroke. Um, instead of a clot, it's an air embolism. Um, and of course it goes to your spine. You get a lot of those sort of things as well. You can also get shooting, stabbing pains, radiate because your spine is just picking up information wrong. And a whole load of weird things can really be caused by it because it's just a random... It's basically the same as a clot that could go anywhere in your body. Um, and it's not particularly not, not particularly a great thing uh, because, you know, anyone's susceptible to it really. I mean, some people are more susceptible. But unlike, say, clots where you suspect them more of old people or people with blood disorders, anyone can really have air coming out of their um, blood, depending on the pressure. Which is, you know, on the, on the whole, not a good thing. So, you know, people tend to take care when they're diving and so on to make sure they stagger their uh, depth changes. And, of course, people have to take care when doing EVAs and stuff as well. Anyway, so here we've uh, just sorting out, trying to make sure we get a uh, an intercept with the space station, the Elysian Stick space station, as it is currently known. It probably needs a more fancy name, uh, but yeah, I've got one. If, if people could probably come up with one, but the problem is, if I ask people to come up with one, uh, a, a year from now, I'll still get comments telling me what they should call the station because I asked that in one of my previous videos. And people are still suggesting what to call that destroyer that we already destroyed. Uh, if you haven't seen that, by the way, those episodes, those are some of my favourite. I really like the culmination of that like three episode arc with the asteroid. That's really cool. I like that bit. Sorry, that's just my favourite one. Um, discuss in the comments what your favourite one is. It's kind of nice that I put so many nuclear engines on because normally when it gets to this stage you're having to be really careful because you know like nuclear engines will take ages to change your velocity. But because I've got so many of them on, I'm actually getting really, fairly good velocity changes. Um, the acceleration that they're giving me is pretty astounding to be honest. Uh, I'm not used to this with nuclear engines. That is because I have added a ridiculous amount of them. Although I must admit I really do like the way the solar panels come out the side. I could have gone for a uh, RTG. But Frankly, these solar panels look pretty cool. They look, it reminds me of some sort of snowflake or some sort of weird biological structure of like a, a virus or something. 
I don't know, it just looks kind of cool. Of course, we're going to have to be careful not to smash them up because then uh, we would lose all the symmetry and it would look pretty naff, which would be sad. I've got the rendezvous planner up just to tell me uh, what my closest approach is going to be and how long to closest approach. Don't really actually need it, mainly because uh, I find it's okay if you really want to use it, but frankly I find it much quicker and more efficient to do uh, it by hand. I mean, going into orbit is about the same time if you use Mechjer, but if you do it by hand you'll get more fuel efficiency, but rendezvousing is so much quicker if you do it yourself. Seriously. Um, so we're, uh, we're dropping down here. Which just happens to be roughly the same position that we've actually got a docking port. So, you know, this has worked out pretty well for us. Just last one on a planet. This is still at four times speed, of course, because uh, you have to be kind of careful and small changes in velocity, blah, 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 blah. So, you know, uh, and you notice I kind of overshoot. Because I'm, I'm trying to use the navball at the moment, and for some reason the navball isn't actually giving me any useful data. Um, you can see where our velocity is, but our target's not showing, despite the fact I've repeatedly said target this docking port. So I've kind of given up on using the navball. Uh, that's like why I initially overshot, I was trying to use the navball and uh, kind of failed massively. But we managed to dock pretty easily, straight away, single click, bam. And now we have Bill, Bob and Jeb all on board the uh, Elysian Stick space station. Must admit, that box does look pretty ugly. But anyway, this is uh, this is what Bill's seeing at the moment, isn't it? Yes. In the crew cabin. Not food. Food. Refuse. Trash. Rubbish. Junk. Because, you know, there's, there's a lot of rubbish and stuff on board the space station. In uh, the Virgin 1 and so on, they, they did a uh, quick investigation to see how much money you save by someone taking a dump before they go up, and apparently it's something like uh, $650 or pounds, can't remember which one it is. So it's a lot of money to be saved by just removing like small amounts of uh, weight. Uh, apparently all the snacks are eaten according to that note, kindly left by Bill, or Bob, it says BK, one of the two. There's the snacks there, but uh, ooh, also a picture, one of their moon landings. Very, uh, very comrad camaraderie-ish? There's a lot of camaraderie going on between these guys, which is nice. Of course, we also have Siegfell up there. Um, he's just going to take over the space station while these other guys go off and do their thing. No offense, you know, Siegfell, but you're, you're, you're not an orange jumpsuit. The orange jumpsuit's uh, the pinnacle. But yeah, I think I think that looks pretty cool. I actually like the space station. Other than the box, the box looks a bit ugly. I, I do like it. And the tug looks pretty cool. I, I like the ring thing. But anyway, um, since we don't really have any of the mods I wanted to use, I decided that we might as well address uh, an issue, and some people have been suggesting is, you know, the rod from God idea. For those of you who don't know, it's basically you get a, uh, a telegraph pole of metal, and, well, not literally a telegraph pole, but it's a pole of metal, and basically you drop it from orbit. Um, now, this was in one of the, the recent Call of Duty trailers, and of course they got it wrong, just like the End War trailer did before that, and pretty much every media depiction I've seen of it. I'm sure there are some that get it right, but most of the ones I've seen have all of the ones I've seen have been wrong. Um, now the problem is they keep firing downwards, and as anyone who plays Kerbal Space Station uh, Space Program knows, if you're in orbit and you fire towards the planet, all you're going to do is shift your orbit, and it's going to be really fuel inefficient. What you need to do is fire backwards along the direction of your orbit. So we're going to give it a go. We're not going to do it wrong, but we're actually going to see if it's actually any use, because if it is good, and we actually manage to get accuracy, which is the main issue here, I'm worrying about accuracy, because we don't have area effect weapons, we mainly require a direct hit. We could put some sort of flechette up that when it's dropping we fire off a load of decouplers or something. But um, the main issue here is whether we can get enough accuracy to be within a few tens of meters, I think, is the maximum we could get with flechettes, really. It's more not a flechette, really, it's more like a cluster. It's not a bomb, it's just a cluster of shrapnel debris field. Anyway. We finally get our thing to orbit. We're actually going for geostationary orbit here. Um, if you really wanted to cover the maximum amount of area, you could do it from a, uh, a low, highly inclined orbit, so that it goes basically over the poles, or near the poles. That way it would cover the entire globe, and you just have to alter your orbit. But we're going to do it from a geostationary. 
Um, now, first time, I'm actually trying to use MechJab to see if MechJab can do it by itself without me intervening. And the second time round, I'm going to use MechJab's prediction because otherwise it's really hard to land at a particular spot without MechJab's prediction, at least at a high speed. Um, so the first time round, I'm going to see if MechJab can do it. Because if MechJab can do it, then, well, it's an effective weapon, isn't it? MechJab does seem pretty good at landing in a location. I don't know if it can do it at high speeds, though. So I guess we'll find out. Now, of course, MechJab won't actually uh, land for you unless you have an already intersecting with the atmosphere orbit, which is what I just found out. We were going around in circles for ages there. So, yeah, I'm going to fire the engine and fire it in the retrograde direction, not down, not directly towards the planet. Why do these places keep thinking you, you fire downwards, you go down? No. You're in orbit. You actually have a velocity. You have a velocity, and it's, it's a circular velocity. You're going round and round and round. If you take the components of your velocity, you're going, like, tangentially sort of towards your away like hard to explain you're going the progray direction if you fire that way all you're going to if you fire towards the planet all you're going to get is a diagonal vector what you need to do is counteract the velocity you already have so you fall towards the planet now the original rods from god idea uses tungsten rods or tungsten rods with uh some depleted uranium in it uh, oh, here we go. D please don't confuse depleted uranium with actual, like, uranium. Depleted uranium is actually less radioactive than the ore that you get uranium from, which is uranite. Um, a lot of people are like, oh, it's nuclear explosion because of the uranium. No, it's not. No, it's not. U depleted uranium is just incredibly dense. It makes for arm piercing rounds because it's so dense, it basically punches through whatever material you fire at. Um, you can see, MechJeb has succeeded in getting us about 420 meters away from the target, which isn't great, to be honest. Um, I mean, even if we're talking in the realms of small nuclear yield, which use what you get from a rod from God, from the kinetic energy alone, if we're talking small nuclear yield, uh, that probably isn't enough to get a, uh, an armored bunker. The rod from God idea is mainly because a lot of the energy goes down, unlike a nuclear explosion where you actually airburst the nuke so that the energy isn't absorbed by the ground. The rod from God has to hit the ground, and that's where the energy is made. It's the kinetic energy, one hitting the other. Now, this energy is basically transmitted down, because the velocity of the object, the rod, is into the ground. So most of the energy is going to get pushed into the ground. And it doesn't make a great aerial weapon. Uh, actually, it makes a really shit aerial weapon. Um, it's incredibly good at penetrating bunkers, though, because that shock wave hits the ground go straight downwards if you hit it on top of a bunker for instance that will shatter concrete easily so what you're basically using them for is mostly for destroying bunkers and stuff they're not particularly great against soft targets they're really pretty crap against soft targets but the energy they have is amazing for penetrating bunkers okay so manually doing it this time and i'm getting pretty close oh oh uh, oh crap, which way round are we orientated? That would have actually possibly been a hit if I'd actually fired the right way at the end there. I forgot which way we were orientated. But well, that was actually fairly... I didn't expect us to get that close. I didn't expect it to be that good. I thought maybe a couple of hundred meters, but we managed to get like within 40. And the plane's moving. Um, I'm just going to take that as we damage the brakes. So. Anyway. Uh, so yeah, actually that works. So I think in the next episode we have to at least set up some sort of rod from God station in geostationary orbit because... I didn't think that would work as well as it did. Uh, brutally honest with you. Geostationary orbit, of course, gives us the issue that we're kind of always looking down at the same side of Kerbin. Not that I'm going to complain much. You know, us and the sticks, we're basically on one side of Kerbin-ish. So, anyway. I've been Enter Elysium. I hope you found the episode interesting, whatever. Uh, next episode, we will be putting some rods from God in orbit, probably, and maybe even making the battleships I talked about and putting some key things stuff down, and maybe even landing some forces stuff. I've got loads of ideas, and, you know, trying to think out what to do next. Anyway, I've been Enter Elysium. Have a good one. Bye. And, of course, stay shiny.